Hi, I'm Sharon Long from Stanford University, and I'm here today to talk about our recent work on the plant side of the nitrogen-fixing symbiosis, specifically about genes and cell responses. By way of review, I'll mention again that the rhizobium symbiosis happens in organs called root nodules. And within these nodules, bacteria are able to fix nitrogen and provide that to the plant for nutrition. This is a complex developmental uh, process. It goes through a number of stages, and you'll see some of those today. It is species specific, which I've discussed in some of my earlier talks. And uh, importantly for today's lecture, bacterium and plant each respond to signals from the other. An outline of my talk today is shown here. Uh, at the beginning, I'll give you some introduction, reviewing some of the dynamics of how bacteria and plants interact. Then I'd like to talk uh, about some recent work in our lab, first about infection, and a, about a group of proteins called flotillins, and also about a nod factor receptor from the plant. Then I'd like to talk about two plant mutants, DNF1 and DNF2, which we've identified uh, as being defective in late stages of nodulation, and by describing the genes that we've now cloned from those mutants, uh, I can uh, share with you some of our ideas on how the symbiosis is working. So here I'm showing a review of the basic idea of signal exchange in the early uh, phases of nodulation. The plant secretes a flavonoid signal. This flavonoid acts as a trigger in the bacterium, and that causes the transcription of genes called nod genes, which encode enzymes. Those enzymes are able to synthesize this second signal, the so-called nod factor, down here, sometimes abbreviated as NF in some of the slides to come. This is a modified um, chitin fragment. You can see there's four residues of N-acetylglucosamine. These are modified at the reducing end with a sulfate and at the non-reducing end with a, both an acetyl and an N-acyl group. And in one of the uh, slides yet to come, I'll be talking about the differences between the plant response to chitin and to a true nod factor. So nod factors are very powerful. And this gives you an idea of just how powerful they are. On the top, we have an alfalfa root, and on this root, Cynorhizobium melolodi, the symbiont, has established a nodule. And this is an intact nodule. It's been cleared. And you can see the uh, deep brown color, which is from the metals that are in the various cytochromes and enzymes of the bacteria while they're fixing nitrogen. Now, at the bottom, we see a form that looks very similar. And yet, this has no bacteria in it. This entire structure on an alfalfa root was uh, caused just by a small droplet of nod factor. So this one chemical is able to produce an entire organ on the plant. Here is another one of the characteristic early events in rhizobium uh, uh, legume interactions. This shows uh, root hairs on the root of a plant. And here on the right, you can see a normal root hair, which grows straight. And here you see a root hair that has been provoked by rhizobium uh, to grow in such a way that it tops over and forms a curl. And here in the uh, crook is uh, where the bacteria are trapped. And these deformed root hairs of various kinds are very characteristic of the effect of uh, the correct rhizobium on its compatible host. Now, the bacteria are then able to uh, uh, travel by proliferating and burrowing their way into the plant cell itself. And this white arrow shows an infection thread. This is formed by the plant in response to the bacteria. Within the infection thread, bacteria are proliferating and they are uh, invading through the root hair cell and, as you'll see, eventually down into further cell layers. So there's the infection thread, and you'll see more about that in a little while. I'd now like to show you something about the dynamics of how rhizobium uh, affect plants. Let's start by looking at normal root hairs. So on a root, the youngest part of the root is over here, and you can see that they don't have any root hairs yet. And then the root hairs get longer, and over here, they're full size. So root hairs get to a particular size, and then they stop. Now let's watch in this movie to see how root hairs elongate normally. Let's without rhizobium. So here you see root hairs. They start, they grow, and then at some point they reach a mature length and they just stop, 
write that. So, but they grow fairly straight during this entire process. Now we're going to look at root hairs uh, on a plant that has been treated with its rhizobium um, symbiont. So here, the root hairs are in the process of growing. And if you watch what happens to them as they grow, you'll see how different it is from unperturbed growth. So here, for example, we see root hairs that are curling. Over on this side, if you look at this root hair, you can see that it's growing and then it pauses. See that pause? And then it emerges and now it pauses and branches again. So there's two things going on. One is this characteristic pause. So right here, you can see there's a pause right before it starts to top over. And the other is that you're getting branching or curling other kinds of deformation. So rhizobium has a profound effect on the morphogenesis of this particular plant cell. Now, we've seen a little bit now about root hair deformation, and I'll mention along the way that uh, rhizobium can also cause roots to engage in specific transcription, which we've studied with microarrays, and they provoke cell division. But for the moment, I just want to look a little bit more about what happens to these root hairs. Because if you uh, think about it, root hairs are on the surface of the plant. They're single cells. They have a high surface to volume ratio. It makes sense that these are going to be exposed to the signals from the outside, and they might be the place where signal transduction begins. So we might ask, uh, by cell biology and by genetics, are there receptors, and what is the signal transduction pathway, and ask whether we can study root hairs as a way of capturing those. Now, signal transduction is often a complex and fairly rapid multi-protein process. So we set out to look for events that occur in root hairs that um, are cell autonomous and fairly rapid. One of the earliest uh, uh, studies that we did in this area was simply to look at the um, electrochemical potential across the plant membrane. So in this, we're taking a single root hair here, and by putting in a microelectrode, and measuring the difference in potential between the interior of the cell and the exterior of the cell, we were able to uh, find that untreated root hairs have a stable, uh, at very negative potential at about 130 to 140 uh, millivolts. However, if we treated a root hair with rhizobium, what we found was that the rhizobium and its nod factor are able to cause a depolarization of that plasma membrane so that the, the potential change across the membrane here diminishes. And that happens actually within a minute. Uh, in our studies and others, this has been shown to be uh, accompanied by ion fluxes, ion currents near the tip. Now, one ion in particular is very interesting to us, and that is calcium. Uh, we've used different techniques, but here's one of them that we have used. On the uh, left, you can see um, a root hair, and into this root hair, we're delivering a mixture of two different fluorescent proteins. One is fluorescent irrespective of the calcium concentration. The other increases its fluorescence when calcium is high. Using those two together, we can take a ratio and get uh, the value of calcium corrected for the uh, concentration of the cytoplasm. And then we can track that over time. So now we're going to follow calcium in this slide. Now, this is a pseudocolor representation of uh, the fluorescence corrected for cytoplasmic concentration. Cool colors mean low calcium. Warm colors mean high calcium. If you take a look at the root hairs here, they're all blue, that means low calcium. As you move in time, and these are 10 second intervals, you see the warmer color, yellow, appearing from the tip of the root hair. So calcium is uh, getting high at the tip. As you continue the time series up here, you can now get to a point where you see this extremely high calcium, shown by red. And this happens to be in the part of the cell represented by the nucleus. So, what can we say, and I'll quantify that with the following graphs. First, if you compare an untreated cell, that's here, and here's the baseline of the calcium, with uh, the presentation of one nanomolar of nod factor, what you find is that about 10 minutes after the presentation of the nod factor, you get these sharp upswings in calcium. And that's what's going on here. This is the calcium spiking represented there. Now, number two, 
If you put in a higher amount of knot factor, 10 nanomolar, now you get something more complex. You get a faster response, and this turns out to be the tip flux of calcium coming in, and then calcium spiking happens at the same time. Now, the, the other data that I'll show you here is that if you take chitin um, alone, now remember uh, I pointed out that nod factor is like a, an oligomer of chitin and acetyl glucosamine residues with some modifications. But what if you take the modifications off? It's not nod factor anymore, it's just chitin. If you add very, very large amounts of chitin up at, um, uh, let's see, we've got one micromolar here, so a thousand fold higher, you get some spiking, but you need much more uh, chitin than nod factor, and it's not completely normal. So for that, we can say that the uh, plant is exquisitely tuned to the nod factor. Finally, we do know that the uh, calcium flux and calcium spiking are not just um, uh, separated uh, in, uh, in space, but they're really independent in that you can add nod factor after, uh, high nod factor after calcium sp spiking has started, and you'll get the big influx. So they really do appear to be two separate events. Now, a third uh, response that we were able to document uh, very early in nodulation is this one, using a whole seedling assay and uh, with um, an indicator that shows the presence of hydrogen peroxide, we can follow normal uh, roots over time and we can assess how much peroxide are they producing. And in a normal untreated root hair, that's shown here. They don't produce zero, they produce a modest amount, and here's what it looks like over a period of about 1.5 hours. Now, what if we treat those with nod factor? What we find, very intriguingly, is that nod factor causes the rate of evolution to be diminished. So a lower level of, nod fa a lower level of hydrogen peroxide is produced um, in the presence of nod factor. Now, what if we add uh, an elicitor, pathogenic elicitor? we would expect an elicitor to cause the plant to mount a defense response. And sure enough, if you look at the amount of uh, hydrogen peroxide coming in the plant after the treatment with elicitor, it's accelerated. So it seems that uh, root, roots are able to elaborate uh, hydrogen peroxide, an example of reactive oxygen species, that nod factor diminishes that, which would suggest it's lowering its defenses, and and the elicitor increases it, consistent with an increase in defenses. Now, this is only over the couple of hours. We're interested here only in very early events. Uh, in fact, uh, the, reaction, the uh, defense reactions appear to have a very interesting and complex role later on in nodulation, but that's, uh, this is not related to those. This is just uh, um, in the first two hours or so. So now we can fill in a bit what we know about the early responses of the plants to the rhizobial nod factor. We know that it causes um, nodules to form, cell divisions in the plant. We now can fill in that in addition to the overall root hair curling, which we could see uh, uh, in the microscope, other kinds of assays demonstrate that there's a rapid depolarization across the plant plasma membrane in response to nod factor. This is accompanied by calcium flux. Slightly later, there's calcium spiking in the cytoplasm and a suppression of the rate of reactive oxygen uh, uh, production. Now, one other topic that I'll just mention briefly is transcription. We've been able to assess transcription uh, during nodulation uh, at various stages uh, with a specialized uh, approach which is uh, shown on the next slide. We, following our work on determining the uh, complete genome sequence of the bacterium, we then constructed an Affymetrics chip in which we had the complete bacterial genome plus about 10,000 uh, sequences representing um, probable genes from EST libraries in the plant, and we put the two genomes on the same Affymetrics chip so we call this our symbio chip. 
And uh, through analysis of RNA species from the uh, nodules, we can actually get a readout of both bacteria and the plant at the same time. And uh, through that, we were able to show that within the first 24 hours after treatment with nod factor or after treatment with bacteria, a characteristic set of plant genes are upregulated or are downregulated, some four dozen or so uh, sequences. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment when I uh, get to the mutant analysis. But now, let me put all of those events on a timeline for you. So I'm going to start here at the left. Now, we know that in the very early stages, within a minute, we get uh, calcium flux, suppression of, uh, react of reactive oxygen. We get a depolarization. There's also calcium spiking at about 10 minutes. There are morphological changes. You saw in the film that the root hairs pause and swell a little bit right before they start to curl. Then there's morphogenesis of the root hair, forming branches and curls and both. And we can see the cell divisions. Finally, the transcription. Now, here's the timeline for that happening. If we uh, start at time zero, and this is where the bacteria are being added, those first events, such as the calcium flux, and the depolarization happen within a few minutes, one to a few minutes, calcium spiking at an average of 10 minutes. The gene expression that I mentioned that we can assess with our Affymetrics chip, that's happening um, as early as a few hours and goes on for about 24 hours. Now the actual curling of the root hair, the deformation of the root hair, takes a while to express. That, of course, we have to keep in mind that this is limited by how fast the root hair can grow. We don't know when the decision to curl is made, but the actual outcome, the mechanics of curling, take uh, somewhat longer. And then here around 20 hours, we're going to start to get infection. The uh, production of the infection thread and the uh, ability of the bacteria now to penetrate in through that root hair. And then the cell division here le leading to the production of the nodule. That's all uh, happening over this period of a day to two days. Now, through um, a set of uh, genetic uh, mutageneses and screens, our group and others have identified many different plant mutants that arrest at one or the other of these uh, stages. And having these subcellular assays to do allowed us to distinguish between the different kinds of uh, plant nod minus mutants. So here's an example. Here on the left is um, a gene called NFP for nod factor perception. If that gene is mutated, you have a block right here. So nothing happens at all. There's no depolarization, there's no calcium flux, no change in the morphology. And then here are um, two mutants um, that are present in such a way that they allow the plant to have calcium flux and it has uh, suppression of reactive oxygen species and so forth. However, it doesn't show calcium spiking. So these two mutants were able to distinguish between the early calcium flux and the calcium spiking itself. They are not only separated in the cell in geography and in time, but they can be separated genetically. Here we found uh, one or, or more mutants that uh, allow calcium spiking, but do not allow any gene expression, and so forth and so on down the line. So with all of this, we are able to set a timeline and a developmental sequence for how signals are transduced. And among other things, we were able to use that transcription assay to distinguish between root hair curling genes and uh, early calcium transduction genes. And we were able to show that all of those plant genes that are expressed um, come on at the same time. It's not the case that you can get a few genes here and a few more here and a few more after that. You get no genes expressed at all up until this point here. And we were able to show that by a combination of mutant analysis and uh, transcription analysis. So that means we're going to be able to say that the series of events shown here, calcium flux, suppression, growth arrest, the pausing, can cluster 
And we can see that one particular gene called NFP, which we believe encodes a receptor, is responsible and required for those events. Then there's a set of uh, two genes, DOMI1 and DOMI2, that are required in order to get to calcium spiking. One of these is an ion channel, the other is a putative receptor kinase. Intriguingly, uh, just downstream from calcium spiking is a, a mutant, DOMI3, and another mutant, Cyclops. These are both required in order for um, any of the later events to occur, such as transcription. So we believe that these genes help interpret the calcium spiking signal and transduce it to the next set of genes, NSP1 and NSP2. These are required for transcription, and indeed, they turn out by sequence to be predicted transcription factors. More transcription factors are also required in order for nodulation to occur. Now, all of these events on the right require the one pathway. This is called the signaling pathway, starting with the signaling receptor, NFP1, and going through transcription factors. But I haven't said anything about infection, and I'd like to mention that. It turns out that the plants appear to have not one receptor, but two. The second receptor is called the stringent or entry receptor, and the name of that gene is LIC3 in the case of Metacago truncatula. This and one of the transcription factors are required in order for infection to occur. So you can have these other events happening, but no infection. This additional set of uh, factors is required for infection. So back to the outline. I've, I've gone through a description of some of the plant cell responses to nod factor and told you about how we have used plant mutants plus those cell phenotypes in order to create an ordered set of steps that we believe represents the tr signal transduction pathway in early nodulation. In the next uh, part of the talk, I'm now going to move, as I say, beyond nodulation. I'll be talking about infection and also about later stages in nodulation. So as we uh, think about uh, the symbiosis, remember, everything that I described in terms of early signal transduction is over here. That's just the beginning. There's so much more to come. There's uh, as the uh, bacteria infect and eventually form the nodule. So now let's take a look at some of the specific topics that are interesting. First, infection. We've already seen that more genes are needed for infection than just for signaling. And the infection thread is a remarkable structure. It penetrates not just through the root hair, but then through multiple uh, layers of plant cells on its way in to uh, find target cells. Now, as this proceeds, the plant elaborates an entire nodule and all the dark cells in this uh, photo are packed full of bacteria. And if you look close up at those, each bacterium is surrounded by an envelope of plant membrane, and within that, the bacteria are going to differentiate. So using uh, different approaches, we're going to take a look at uh, how the plant manages to support these really remarkable events. We'll start with infection. Uh, as I mentioned, um, infection occurs beginning in the root hairs, and what we wanted to ask is, how does the inside of the plant cell cope with the invasion of the bacterium? How does it reorganize itself? We decided to take a look at um, some candidate genes called flotillins. These are genes uh, that are originally identified in animals. I'll give a brief review, and then I'll, I'll uh, show you our data that demonstrate that plant flotillins uh, in, are active in nodulation. There's two copies of flotillin that are specifically upregulated in nodules. Uh, the, their transcription is regula regulated along with other nodulation um, uh, genes. They're required for infection, they're required for elongation, and remarkably, the proteins of these flotillins have very striking localizations that we believe relate to the mechanism of infection. So what are flotillins? They've been studied widely in animal cells. This diagram shows an animal cell with plasma membrane. Flotillins are shown here. There's two of them. They're outlined in red. 
They have a domain that is affiliated with the membrane and a tail that is cyto more cytoplasmic, and it is thought that they um, relate to signaling, to endocytosis, and to activity of the actin network within the cell. Um, it's also uh, been demonstrated that these um, flotillins uh, occur in what are sometimes termed membrane microdomains, also sometimes called lipid rafts, although the terminologies are actively being discussed uh, these days. Now, plants have flotillins too, although they have not been widely studied. Uh, in Arabidopsis, the sequence shows that there are three flotillins. In our analysis, we found more than seven in the legume Metacago truncatula. The, um, of these seven, we found that two are uniquely expressed in nodules. We found that the proteins are, as with animals, flotillins present in small uh, domains or puncta. And uh, I'll show you that one of the two has a very special uh, localization during infection. Now, the uh, predicted structures of the flotillins in plants looks very much like the animals with a domain, a head domain, and a tail domain. So we might expect that it's going to have some of the same properties. So, as I mentioned, Arabidopsis has only three flotillins, but Metacago truncatula has uh, more than seven. And here's one of the really interesting things for us, is that there are a great number of these that are actually all linked together. Now you'll see here that there's flotillin three and one, then there's down here flotillin four and flotillin two. We believe that those are active flotillins. One of the others shown here, flotillin five, is in the same genomic region, but we believe it's uh, not uh, an active gene. Now, we took a look at the activity of the promoters for each of those flotillins. And what you can see here is at the top, flotillin one, it's, uh, Promoter is active in the vasculature. It's here, it's expressing um, a gus fusion. Flotillin-3 also is active in the vasculature. Uh, but if you take a look at flotillin-2 and flotillin-4, these are being expressed in nodules. We can also quantify the transcript, and the same story emerges. We can see here that flotillin-1 and 3 are at a low level throughout nodulation, but both flotillin uh, two and flotillin four are strongly upregulated in the first day after roots are presented with uh, bacteria. Flotillin four comes down, although flotillin two stays uh, fairly well expressed during uh, at least a couple of weeks of nodulation. So, in terms of their expression, these appear to be uh, especially uh, associated with nodule development. Does that relate to any of the um, formalities that we know right now about the genetics of early nodulation? So remember that there are a set of genes that I introduced earlier, and we have mutations in these various steps uh, for um, um, nodule signal transduction, and that transcription occurs only after a whole set of steps have uh, taken place. So what about flotillin two and four? And as you can see in this bar graph, those two flotillins actually require the same signal transduction pathway in order to be expressed. Here is a wild type. On the left, we're seeing flotillin two and four. And then here are a couple of the nodulation mutants. LIC3, NSP2, NIN1, those are here. NSP and NIN, here is LIC3 for a receptor for nod factor. These appear to be required in order for the flotillins to be upregulated. We can also show that some of the downstream genes are not required. Now, we know that these flotillins are controlled in the same way that nodulation genes are controlled. But what about their function? Through using RNAi approaches, we can diminish the uh, activity of the various flotillins. And here's one particular experiment. Uh, and these results have been uh, borne out in others, although the absolute numbers uh, tend to vary. So if we take a look at a wild-type plant, for example, we can see 
that it's got about six nodules per plant. If you knock out flotillin one and three, there's again about six. But if you knock out flotillin two, there's many fewer nodules. Flotillin two and flotillin four, if knocked out together, is even more. But flotillin four knocked out by itself does not appear to have much of an effect on the number of nodules. If you look at the percentage of plants with nodules, you don't see a major effect. In fact, if you have, if, if anything, you seem to get a few increases of the percentage of plants that have some kind of growth on them. But now if we look at the percentage of nodules that are actually fixed plus, which is indicated by the pink color from like hemoglobin, you can see that uh, about, uh, in this particular experiment, almost 30% of the wild type nodules appear to be functioning uh, about the same for flotillin one and three knockouts. But if flotillin two is knocked out, then there's a striking uh, diminution of the number of functional nodules and uh, a less striking uh, but still significant change for flotillin four. And the double mutant uh, almost completely wipes out any effectiveness of the nodules that do form. So we would conclude from that that flotillin-2 and flotillin-4 are both required for nodulation and that they are not redundant because the double mutant has a more severe phenotype than either of the single mutants alone. <clears throat> We've also now gone to take a look at the proteins and what we found is the following. Let's begin on the left with flotillin-2. This is a view of epidermal cells. So we're looking down at the surface of the root here. And you can see that flotillin-2 is present in little dots or puncta. And there's a very striking localization of flotillin-2 at the uh, polar end of the cell. <clears throat> That's uh, in the root hairs. The flotillin-2 is very strikingly punctate. It's present in these little dots. And this kind of um, distribution remains the case if the plants are inoculated. And that's shown in the lower part of the left-hand side. So uninoculated and inoculated, flotillin-2 is punctate. It remains fairly stable, although there are some subtle, some subtle changes in density and in uh, polarity. But we got um, a very striking result with flotillin-4. And I'll show you that here. Then let's start on the top again. The epidermal cells and root hair cells. And it's very striking that the flotillin-4 uh, signal, GFP uh, fusion signal, is present in puncta. But even more uh, striking was that after inoculation, what starts out as an even distribution of flotillin-4 in root hairs becomes a highly polar distribution. And that's shown with these red arrows, where you can see that at the tips of these inoculated bacteria-treated root hairs, flotillin-4 has migrated to the tip. So that suggests that flotillin-4 has a very active uh, participation in something having to do with what goes on at root hair tips. So we began to look specifically at infection. Using uh, wild type as control, where you can see bacteria uh, invading these blue lac stained bacteria show infection threads for uh, um, bacteria on a wild type plant. Here's a nice infection thread growing through a root hair on the wild type. But in a flotillin-4 minus mutant, things are not working very well. What you're seeing here is that there's uh, no significant uh, penetration deep into the nodule. Furthermore, even if you look at a root hair, the uh, infection threads uh, are lack integrity. They're not well structured. And uh, we find, in fact, that they don't succeed. They don't penetrate. So it appears that flotillin-4 function is important for infection threads. And we also now have evidence that shows that flotillin-4 is, is associated with infection threads. Flotillin-2 is uh, shown here, bright green fluorescence around the cell. This particular root hair, which is curled, has been infected. And it has bacteria that fluoresce red. Those bacteria are shown here. But you can see that the flotillin-2 is around the membrane of the outer cell. It's not affected, not close by, to the red fluorescence of the bacteria. However, if we look at flotillin-4, that's shown here. 
Flotillin 4-GFP is around the outside, but it's also here. See, around the infection thread, green fluorescence, and here's the red bacteria inside the fluorescence. So that suggests that flotillin-4 is affiliated with the infection thread membrane. Now you'll recall that um, in the uh, sequence of genes that are important for nodulation signal transduction, uh, one set is called the signaling pathway here, but more genes are needed in order to get infection, including the entry receptor, LIC3. Now that we've got some clue that flotillins are involved in infection, we might want to ask whether we can place flotillins in any kind of relationship to the genes that have been previously found to be important for early signaling and infection. Now, in the following um, uh, photos, I'm looking at the puncta density of flotillin-4. Here's a wild type. And the, the puncta density is the number of bright spots per uh, square microns, right? So you might have a little, a little um, square micron there, and then you plot the number. And I'm going to compare that wild type to three different mutants. Each of these is a mutant in the putative entry receptor, LIC3. LIC3-1, which um, is the most severe, and two other alleles, LIC2 and uh, LIC3-2 and 3-4. Um, the LIC3-1 is predicted to have um, a protein with a dead kinase domain. And what we saw looking at this particular index of puncta density is that if you compare the wild type number here to the number in the LIC3-1 mutant, the puncta density for FLOT4 is greatly diminished significantly lower. We don't draw any mechanistic conclusion from this, but it did give us the sense that maybe LIC3 itself, together with FLOAT4, would be worth looking at. So we want to ask whether LIC3 and flotillin-4 interact. We're going to need to study LIC3. And we were fortunate to collaborate with uh, Doug Cook, Brendan Riley, and their colleagues at UC Davis. And we have, thanks to their contributions, we have the following tools for study. First and most importantly, a stable transgenic of Metacago truncatula that carries a GFP fusion to LIC3 under the control of its own promoter. It's known that this is functional because it complements a LIC3-1 mutant. Because it's under its own promoter, we have more reassurance about its correct position uh, and localization. Now into this stable transgenic, we're now going to introduce a second uh, marker. We're going to create a transformant that also has flotillin-4 fluorescent um, linked to the fluorescent M cherry protein. So we'll have green fluorescence for LIC3, red fluorescence for M cherry, and our particular tool is going to be a spinning disc confocal uh, at the Carnegie Institution uh, in collaboration with David Earhart. We were able to, uh, to visualize the LIC3 putative receptor in root hairs. So the results are shown here. We have uh, LIC3 GFP. It's present in the root hair. You can see that it's punctate. And when we took a look at um, the LIC3 plant with infections, we, we found the following. Here's a curled root hair. And you can see going down through the curled root hair is an infection thread. And the green fluorescence of that LIC3 is all the way along the infection thread membrane. So we can see that the LIC3 putative receptor is localizing the same way that the flotillin-4 uh, appears to do along the infection thread as it uh, moves into the cell. Now, an important control is shown here also. Um, root hairs and other parts of uh, plant cell walls have autofluorescence as well. And we wanted to ask whether the green fluorescence we saw here was really due to the LIC3 or was it autofluorescence. The results of that are shown in this um, other panel. Now, this is a fusion of LIC3 to a non-fluorescent protein. And again, there are bacteria that are fluorescing red. Well, what you can see is that it's a good idea to do this control because the crook of the root hair is very highly autofluorescent. So if we were to see this and say it's GFP fluorescence, we'd be wrong because that's just what the root hair uh, cell wall is doing. You, you can see here the infection thread is moving down with the red fluorescence and uh, 
the, uh, there is no green fluorescence around it. So infection threads are not intrinsically fluorescent. It's only that the LIC3 GFP is providing that signal. So now we know that flotillin 4 and LIC3 appear to localize to the same place. Can we find out anything else about them? So in this, um, we have um, started to use that double transgenic. So what's going on here is that this plant has LIC3 GFP. It also has flotillin 4 M cherry. Now these are close-ups below. You can see the LIC3 GFP flotillin 4 cherry. And in, these are uninfected root hairs. And if you merge the two images, it's possible to see here that the green and red are distinct. So that suggests that they are not co-localizing within uh, the distance that where their fluorescence would, would mix and make a yellow color. Now, taking a look at that uh, more statistically, we can do a correlation plot as shown here, where uh, on one axis, on the x-axis, that's the fluorescence intensity of one. On the y-axis is the fluorescence intensity of the other. And in fact, there's a distribution all the way around. It doesn't particularly correlate. If you have a high fluorescence of M. cherry, that could be either low or high uh, fluorescence of GFP. But what happens when we treat root hairs with bacteria? And that's shown here. Now, again, we've got the GFP. Here's a close-up. We've got the M. cherry for the flotillins and a close-up. But now, when we do the co-localization, you can see that there appears to be a merging of the green and red fluorescence to present a, a higher number of puncta that look yellow. So we would say there appears to be an increase in the correlation of, um, of their, their location. And here's another way of looking at that. The correlation plot now shows um, a correlation coefficient that's uh, more than uh, 0.5. That means that more than half the time, you're getting a correlation of the intensity of fluorescence of one and the other. So that suggests to us that whether or not flotillin-4 and LIC-3 are associated depends on whether the bacteria have interacted with the root hair. So we pursued that a little more. Another way that we have started to look at that is to examine the dynamics, not just the location, but the dynamics of what these proteins are doing. So in this um, experiment, we're going to be looking at a root hair which has a LIC3 GFP fusion. So that's the only uh, fluorescence you're going to see. It's just the receptor LIC3. And what you're going to be seeing in the micrographs is as if you took a, a plane like this, right? Uh, through the root hair, and where you see that this bright uh, point, that's uh, what is going to be shown now on the films. Now, the left hand, we're going to look at LIC3 in an uninfected root hair. So one of the things you can see is that it's very dynamic. If you try to focus on a point and see, follow the LIC3, it, it's moving around too much. You can't do that. But now let's look at a root hair that has been treated with bacteria. What a difference. Now you're looking at the LIC3 fluorescence, and it's really behaving itself. It's sort of staying in place. And these two arrowheads, for example, show places that you can focus in, and you can see a LIC3 signal that's not moving. It's fairly stable. So that suggests to us that it's not just where LIC3 is. It's how fast it's moving. and um, perhaps shuttling around, that is being changed by the presence of the bacteria, which is um, uh, remarkable. And uh, that led us to another way to look at LIC3 together with flotillin-4. In the following, we won't be looking at movies, but we'll be representing the dynamics over time through what's called a chymograph. Now, what you're seeing on the left is um, a micrograph of the receptor LIC3 GFP fluorescence, flotillin-4 fluorescence, and the merge. Likewise, here for uh, bacterially treated root hairs, LIC3 GFP, flotillin-4 cherry, and then, and then the merge. Now, at each uh, point in time, 
We don't look at the whole root hair. We're going to just be looking at a transect shown here and also shown over here by these blue arrows. And at any one point in time, just that line is going to be uh, represented as follows. Here, if we take this line going across the uh, uninfected LIC3 GFP, um, then we can see at any one 10 second period whether a particular position was light or dark. We can follow that over time and we can see that this, the correlation is rather loose. However, flotillin-4 is very stable. If you look at the um, flotillin-4, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and so forth, it's, if it's fluorescent at one 10 second interval, it's highly likely to be fluorescent in the next one. And so you get this, this set of lines going through. Now, if we take a look at root hairs that are treated with bacteria, we find, um, sorry, we find the following. Um, again, this is what the uh, root hairs look like. But if we follow them over time, you can now see that the LIC3 GFP is very stable. If, it's, if that transect shows a bright point at one 10 second interval, it's probably going to be bright the next 10 second interval as well. So the LIC3 has settled down. The flotillin-4 is still very stable. And when you take a look at the merge, you can see that there appears to be a correlation of the brightness. So as we summarize, we can say the following that the um, punctal density is changed uh, for a float-4 GFP in a genetic background where uh, LIC3 is mutated. We can see that LIC3 itself uh, lo localizes in puncta. That suggests it's in membrane microdomains. Also, it localizes to infection threads. We found that in uninfected root hairs, the, uh, the receptor uh, and the flotillin do not have uh, much overlap, and also they are very different in their motility, in their dynamics. However, after inoculation with uh, rhizobium melilodi, the receptor and the flotillin co-localize, and their dynamics remain similar. Not known is whether this is direct or indirect. What is the nature of the protein-protein interactions? Because fluorescence in and of itself is relatively uh, loose. Uh, uh, it does not have to have precise molecular um, adjacency. So further uh, fluorescence studies with FRET and biochemical studies will be necessary. And uh, we think that following the combination of this uh, flotillins and receptors is going to be a very exciting way to ask how the plant is mobilizing itself to accept inf infection. So back to the outline. I've uh, finished uh, talking a little bit about how a candidate gene approach took us from the study of flotillins to the study of infection. In this next segment, I'd like to talk about some mutants that we've uh, isolated called the DNF mutants. These uh, have identified plant genes necessary for the final stages of symbiosis. And I'll talk about two of those, DNF1, which encodes a signal peptidase, and DNF2, a putative phospholipase C. So looking again at the sequence of nodulation, uh, we're now taking a look at an even later stage where bacteria have penetrated into the nodule and they get released into uh, the uh, cells and they're able to fix nitrogen. So the DNF mutants called uh, defective in nitrogen fixation were uh, isolated out of a screen that we did of mutants that we generated by fast neutron bombardment. This often creates uh, deletions. Uh, it's an ionizing radiation. Um, and so these are severe mutants. When we screened them, we found a number of mutants which were like this. Instead of being nice pink nodules here, the DNF mutants are white, and they're small. They don't have any nitrogenase activity, and that's shown as, uh, uh, in this slide by um, assessment of acetylene reduction, shown here. Wild type is able to convert acetylene to ethylene, which is an indicator for a nitrogenase enzyme. But the DNF mutants, as you can see, have very low or even no ability to fix nitrogen. Now, they also don't seem to have completely normal development. One of the mutants, DNF1, is shown here. And we got two alleles of that. They're very similar. Wild type, 
uh, nodule has cells filled with bacteria. Um, the bacteria do get infected into the DNF1 nodules as well. Nonetheless, they uh, are not as large and they do not seem to be able to fix nitrogen. So we took a look further at DNF1 and one of the ways in which we uh, studied this was uh, as, fo as follows. Here's a wild type nodule shown in section and this nodule uh, in, in, in this case has been established by the action of a bacterium carrying a glucuronidase fusion into the promoter for the nitrogenase genes. That means that if the bacteria are expressing their nitrogenase, then the uh, nodule will turn blue in the presence of a glucuronidase substrate. So what we see here is that the NIF-H, which is nitrogenase, glucuronidase fusion is turned on. That's good. That means that the bacteria are expressing their nitrogen fixation genes. However, what we found was the DNF1 was the following. Taking a look at these nodules with the same exact bacterium carrying a glucuronidase fusion to the NIF promoter, we found no activity. You could see here with the red arrow, it's pointing to the nodule, but there's no blue stain. So we conclude from this that the bacteria are not able to express the genes for nitrogen fixation. So we can say that the bacteria need the plant's DNF1 in order for the bacteria to fix nitrogen or even to express the nitrogen fixation genes. So what is DNF1? Um, this gene in the plant encodes one of the uh, subunits of a, what turns out to be a nodule-specific signal peptidase. And I'll tell you about nodule-specific and the other components in a moment. But first, I'll just review a little bit what signal peptidase is. In, um, in a eukaryotic cell, we've got the endoplasmic reticulum, and uh, proteins that are being extruded into the lumen uh, may, may get there by a signal peptide. And if the signal peptidase cleaves off that uh, signal peptide, and that allows the production of the mature protein, which would be shown here. Now, once that mature protein is formed, after its signal peptide is taken off, then it may be uh, targeted for secretion or for vesicle trafficking. So what we found is DNF1, required for bacterial uh, gene expression and differentiation, has something to do with protein processing. Now let's take a look at the expression of this gene. What, if you take a look at the vegetative parts of the plant, such as the leaf and stem, uh, or flowers, what you find is that expression of the DNF1 uh, signal peptidase subunit is very low, but it's quite high in nodules. It's also present to some extent in developing seeds, although at a much lower level. Taking a look at the time course, what we can see is here. The DNF1, if you plot days of nodule growth and development and DNF1 expression, you can see that DNF1 goes up early in uh, nodule development. And you can also track it during seeds and find that it's relatively steady during uh, the maturation of seeds. So DNF1 is most highly expressed in nodules and it goes up very early in those nodules. Now, um, let's take a look not just at DNF1, but using transcription, let's take a look at what genes out of all the microarray data tend to be expressed whenever DNF1 is expressed. And those are shown here. Now, on the left, you can see the names of the uh, proteins. This is what they do. And what you can see is that there's the other uh, subunits in the signal, peptide, signal peptidase uh, uh, complex are also regulated up in early nodules the same way the DNF1 is. In addition, the signal peptide peptidase, which is needed for completion of the um, degradation of the signal peptide, that's also upregulated. And finally, this very intriguing protein, CYP132, syntaxin-132. Now, what are syntaxins? This is a reminder of how they have been uh, characterized in animal cells. Syntaxins are important proteins for vesicle targeting. And in fact, CYP132 here in the plant probably marks the last step of protein secretion. And empirically, it has been observed on plant plasma membranes and also 
on what's called the symbiosome membrane. That's the membrane that surrounds the bacterium once it's inside the cell. So if we take a look at all of these genes, we can see that they are co-regulated. So we've got a whole signal peptidase complex, and what is it doing? One of the most important questions that could be asked is, what are the substrates? What proteins does this signal peptidase help to mature? And the answer came from work in um, the labs in Gif uh, sur and in Zegad, Hungary, uh, led by Eva Konder Roshi and Peter Mergat and their colleagues. And what they have described is a set of proteins called nodule cysteine rich peptides. These are characteristic of nodules. They are not expressed anyplace else in the plant. And they are rich in cysteine and bear some resemblance to defensins, which are uh, proteins made uh, by plants and uh, animals in response to microbes. They were able to show, using our DNF1 mutant, that one of these, uh, for example, uh, NCR peptide number one in a wild type plant gets processed to a smaller molecular weight. But unless the DNF1 peptidase is there, it does not get processed. Because here is our mutant, and you can see that the protein shown here in immunoblot is larger. It's because its signal peptide was never taken off. They have also been able to show that with antibodies, that in wild type cells, if you use a green dye to indicate the bacteria and a red uh, fluorescence for the uh, antibody to the NCR peptide, they co localize. Bacteria and NCR peptides co localize in a normal wild type cell. Here, they showed an example of what happens in a uh, mutant DNF1 cell. You can see that the um, bacteria are all over the place in green, but that this NCR peptide, which we know is not being processed, right, because it's large molecular weight, that NCR peptide is stuck someplace, probably in the endoplasmic reticulum. So their conclusions, together with our work on the DNF1, are that the NCR peptides are substrates of the DNF1 complex. In wild type, these are delivered to the symbiosome, and in DNF1, they're retained in the ER. They've shown in other work that these uh, mature NCR peptides have profound effects on bacteria, such as uh, causing them to cease cell division and uh, changing their membrane per permeability. So um, that's an ongoing story about the activity of the NCRs. To complete the model so far, uh, we might ask, uh, what does DNF1 do? And one uh, likely activity is that it processes NCR proteins. These end up in the lumen of the ER, and they are targeted, perhaps using uh, uh, CYP132 as part of the mechanism for targeting, into vesicles, which come over and fuse with the symbiosome, in which rhizobium are going to uh, be differentiating. Now, we also have questions about DNF1 beyond the NCR proteins. For example, DNF1 is present even in legume plants that do not have the NCR proteins. So what is it doing there? Another uh, question is, uh, in the uh, DNF1 mutant, the bacteroids do not differentiate, but they also stop dividing. So it seems that even without DNF1, there may be other signals that are helping these bacteria to uh, stop dividing. So we hope that we'll be able to work on those as well as on the actual mechanism of DNF1 in the next period of our work. I'd now like to finish by telling you about the other mutant, DNF2. And this, as you recall, as shown right there, that also had no nitrogen fixation. And we've done some work to characterize what's going on with DNF1 and also to figure out what the gene is. Here is a picture in which you can see from the uh, root part to the distal part of the nodule uh, fluorescently labeled bacteria, and they are inside. We can tell that the bacteria get inside the DNF2 mutant nodules. However, they don't express nitrogenase, and they don't express many other bacterial genes either. So somehow DNF2 is again required for the bacteria to differentiate and, in fact, to uh, express genes. 
Now we know that DNF2 is um, expressed only in nodules, even more strictly than DNF1. This shows you some promoter gust fusions where you can see that the uh, early part of the nodule is expressing DNF2, and here you can see it at the tip, and then it diminishes just slightly as the nodules get somewhere, um, uh, somewhat older. What is DNF2? It appears to be uh, similar to a phospholipase C, but it's not a canonical phospholipase C the way we're used to seeing. Um, here would be the classic PLC. And you can see it's got the um, uh, inositrous phosphate, binding, EF hands, catalytic domains, calcium binding domains, and so forth. The uh, DNF2 is only uh, homologous to one part of this large complex phospholipase C. However, we do find that it is very, very similar to um, a phospholipase C whose model is shown here. This is actually a bacterial phospholipase C. And if you take this in red and then superpose DNF2, it does appear to be uh, very, very similar in its 3D structure. So we want to know what's the biochemical activity. Sequence alone doesn't tell us whether it really acts to, um, uh, to um, process phospholipids or as a signaling. But we found one other thing that's really surprising to us. First, as I mentioned, it's only expressed in nodules, but secondly, it's not expressed in the cells of the plant that have rhizobium. It's expressed in the non-infected cells of the nodule. And that's really a first. Um, there are known metabolic uh, enzymes in soybean, for example, that are present in uninfected cells. But there has never been found a regulator that appears to be active in the non-infected cells of the uh, root nodule. So what we're trying to ask ourselves is, does the DNF2 protein mediate the infection process uh, directly or indirectly? Is it acting in some way that allows the non-infected cells to send signals or perhaps to avoid signals? So those are some of the uh, questions that lie ahead for us. So winding up the combination of the studies that I've shown you today, uh, I think that the future of our field is going to be very exciting as we take the results of the plant mutants and we study the proteins uh, that are defined by those mutations and look at how those work, both plant and bacteria together, not looking just at position, but looking at time. We're interested in uh, the uh, great questions of what the signals are and how the signals are transduced. Given that so much complicated cell biology has to happen between the beginning of the infection thread and the maturation of the symbiosome, we want to know not just the regulation, but what is the machinery of this infection. And we believe that both the uh, proteins and molecular probes that we can obtain can be used to study the individual steps of nodulation as they move forward. So that concludes our journey through the plant side of symbiosis.